In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, today we gather in the parish church in the second half of the Lenten fast. Whether you believe Father Gregory or not, the reality has happened yesterday, it feels like, was forgiven Sunday, and today we are now on the Sunday of the latter, the Sunday of St. John Climacus, which is the beginning of the end. We are as we said, as we uh, celebrated the pre-sanctified, we said the prayers for those preparing for illumination. Uh, and this is the first sign that things are beginning to end. And here the Lord has given us this excellent reminder through his church, both a way to live and a way to be illumined for the spiritual life and through the Holy Gospel, how it is we are to accomplish these things. In today's Gospel, there is a man who comes to Christ, and Christ is coming down from the mountain. This is the ninth chapter of Mark. This story is in all of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and this happens immediately after the transfiguration. In, in Luke, it says that the people are amazed at seeing him because his face is still radiantly shining from the glory he revealed to his disciples. And this man comes to the Lord with his son, and says, Lord, please help my son, for he is demon-possessed. I brought him to your disciples, and they could do nothing. And so the Lord then asks, well, what is wrong with this child? And he says that when, that there, when there is a full moon, he will throw himself into a fire, or he will throw himself into water, and he foams at the mouth, and he has seizures, and he has all of these different things. He's acting like he is insane. And he said, and then the Lord then continues this this uh, conversation with him as this child is on the ground. He says, "How long has this been happening?" And he says, "Since childhood." And if you can do anything, please have compassion on us. Now the Lord didn't immediately heal the child because here this man reveals his lack of faith. Even in his request, he is trying to give himself an out. He's saying, oh, if you can do something, that would be great, is basically what he's saying. Like, if you can do it, meaning, if you can't, no worries, it's fine, um, and, and I won't be surprised. So what he's saying here is, you may be able to help, you may not, and I simply do not have the confidence in your capabilities because your disciples were unable to do so as well. And the Lord, mourning his people, says, oh, thou perverse generation, how long must I put up with you? You are so weak of faith. And so then he tells this person, this man, who said, you know, if you can do this, if you can do this, please have compassion on us. He says, anything can be done to him who believes. So he's drawing this man in. He's drawing this man into a profession of faith. And the man does not simply say, okay, I believe, do it. But he recognizes in this moment his own inadequacy. He recognizes his inability to trust the Lord. And so he says, Lord, I believe Help my unbelief. Such a beautiful and wonderful prayer. In treating the Lord earnestly, whereas before he was allowing room for doubt, here he not only tells him that he believes, but asks him to help in his unbelief, asks the Lord to strengthen his faith. And so the Lord, having compassion upon him and seeing that this was an earnest call, not only in a call for increase of faith, but increase for help for his son, he cast out the demon. And the demon rent him sore. He fell to the ground and was as one dead, so much so that the people themselves said he was dead, but the Lord raised him up and he was healed. And then later his disciples came to him and said, Lord, why could we not do this thing? Why could we not do what we just witnessed? You just cast out the demon, and this, saying the same things that we did, but why could we not do it? And he simply says that this kind in the Gospel of Mark, this kind comes out by prayer and fasting. In Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, he says that you were not able to do it because of your lack of faith. And they say, well, Lord, how can we strengthen our faith? And he says this can only be done by prayer and fasting. Now, prayer and fasting are the fundamental and foundational aspects of the Christian life. Without these, one cannot truly be a Christian. One cannot truly live the Christian life. Because through fasting, we undermine all of the vices that have taken them, their hold in our soul. It was through Adam's inability to control his stomach that he fell from paradise. It was through eating that he fell. And it is through controlling 
what enters into our body, and what amount and at what times that we are able to regain that which Adam lost. And through that control of this bodily passion, all of the others fall in line because it is from our inability to control our stomachs that the other passions flow. From our inability to, from our gluttony, then comes lust, and through lust, avarice, and through avarice, greed, and so on and so forth. And then prayer, of course, is absolutely essential in this, because without prayer, there are many who fast. There are many who pray. There are, there are many who, um, who fast, who do all of these great works of virtue, right? There are those who are very generous. They give to the poor. Uh, they, they do whatever, but they don't believe, right? They have no belief. They simply want to be a good person, or they want to do good things for other people, but they do not couple it with prayer. It is through prayer that we bring these things that are, we're doing to the Lord, that we unite them to the heavenly, that they find their proper place in the Christian life. Now, it's simple enough to say that we have to pray and fast, and people might be able to say, okay, that's perfectly fine. But what does that look like on the ground? Because I think very often we fail to achieve these things through our misunderstanding of them or through our inability to grasp to what degree we have actually acquired these things whether it be prayer or fasting. So we'll start with prayer. Prayer is not simply reading words standing in front of icons, right? St. Paul tells us to pray without ceasing. What he's not telling us to do is stand before our icons and repeat the morning prayers until noon and then repeat the evening prayers until we have to wake up. That's not what he's saying, right? Because there's more to prayer than simply saying some words in front of the icons. This is an excellent aid in prayer. This is an important uh, tool to bring us to prayer, but this itself is not necessarily prayer. So too, attending service is not necessarily prayer. While it is an excellent way to achieve prayer, it is itself not prayer. Prayer, from all of the Holy Fathers, is the abiding in God. St. John uh, Climacus, whose memory we celebrate today on this Sunday, uh, well actually, this is a... We celebrated him on Friday. His feast day was Friday, but on the Sundays of Lent, we celebrate St. John on the fourth Sunday. Now, the feast day for today is St. Mary of Egypt, but we celebrate her feast next Sunday on the Sunday of St. Mary of Egypt, that last Sunday of Lent. Anyways, St. John says that the one who prays stands before men, but is mine, but in his heart he is knocking at the gates of heaven. Prayer, ultimately, then, is standing before the presence of God and being with him. As our Lord Jesus Christ himself says in the Gospel of John, Abide in me and I in you. If any of you abide in me, you will bear much fruit and have life in you. But if you do not abide in me, you will be cut off and cast into the fire. This is what it means to pray, is to be with Christ. To be with him, whether we eat, whether we sleep. Whether we drink, whether we stand before the icons and say our prayers, whether we stand in church, whether we are around others, we should at all times struggle and strive to be with the Lord. Now, this can be done in many ways. I already mentioned the one, which is saying prayers. Of course, this is good to say prayers, but there are many other ways to achieve this state of prayer, one of which is spiritual reading. I think it is no accident that on towards the end of the Lent, we are given this, uh, this Sunday as a reminder, this Sunday of the ladder. So there's only one book, one, one uh, spiritual treatise that is called to be read in churches, and that is the Ladder of Divine Ascent, written by St. John. It is the quintessential spiritual text. It is the quintessential text to show us the path to the kingdom of heaven, how it is we're supposed to fight the passions. Of course, it was written for monks, but that does not preclude those living in the world to read it and to glean the great wisdom that is therein, because it is very much applicable to us as well. But the point in that is that through spiritual reading, this foundational aspect of our Christian faith, we can come to know better where it is we need to struggle, how we need to struggle, with what we need to struggle. All of these are very important. These are, and these, it gives us the means through which to learn how to struggle against our passions, to put to practice the things that we discover through fasting. Because it is through fasting we come to know ourselves, and this is why fasting is so important. Through fasting, the fasting done right, fasting done well, it weakens the body, right? It makes one tired, it makes, it brings somebody down. And what happens, 
when we are brought into that state is we are rendered in a position where we are unable to as effectively fight against those inclinations in our soul. And so very often when we enter into, for example, Great Lent, we enter into these various fasting periods, we will discover all of a sudden that we're struggling in areas we didn't think we would. You know, we, we think, oh, this is the passion I'm going to struggle with. And another one comes out of left field. We go, where did that come from? How did that get here? And that is because it was percolating below the surface. It was hidden from us. We were unable to see it, whether because of earthly cares or because of our habits or whatever. We weren't able to see it. And so through the fasting periods, all of these things come forth. We come to see ourselves in a better way than we were able to see them outside of fasting. And through this, we know where it is we need to struggle. Very often we are tempted uh, during the Great Lent, especially at the beginning when these things start to come, to fall into despair. To say, well, I, this is terrible. I've gone into all of these sins. I can't go on. I need to just give up. But this is what we need in the fast, brothers and sisters, to see ourselves, to know how bad the problem is. Great Lent is a great, is a great uh, revelation for us. It peels back those layers that we've been hiding so we can see ourselves for what we are. Not what we want to be, not what we think of ourselves, but what we are in reality. We're faced with our own failure, we're faced with our own weakness, and through that we can really begin to pray just as this man, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief, or Lord, I want to be virtuous, help me with this virtue. Help me against this vice. So through these two things, through prayer, which brings the virtues to Christ, and through fasting, which we discover those areas in which we need to cultivate virtue, we are able to strengthen our faith. Faith is another thing that is very often misunderstood. We, many times when people have doubts, they think they have lost their faith. Or that faith is something that simply you have or you don't. You either have faith or you don't have faith. That's simply not true. Faith is something that, like all of the other virtues, must be cultivated, must be strengthened, must be given the chance to grow. If we stifle our faith by not fasting, by not praying, for whatever reason, then our faith will diminish. If we desire to grow our faith, then we enter into the services of the church. We enter into our prayer lives. We struggle to tighten our belts a little bit, to eat simple foods to eat as much as we need, not what we want. These are the ways in which we strengthen our faith. Through those things, we cultivate within ourselves a knowledge of God through knowing ourselves better, through knowing our weaknesses, through knowing our wicked proclivities, and then we can struggle to be with Christ. And through this, we can then address those demons within ourselves that have been there for all of our lives, as was with this child. That, were, that have been with us since childhood, that do with us what they want to do with us, and we have no power over them. And perhaps we have grown into despair about this. Perhaps we have said, well, this is just here, and there's nothing I can do about it, and I can't heal it. And then we go to church and say, well, maybe Christ can heal it. Maybe Christ can do it. Maybe he can't. Maybe I'll have this thing forever. Maybe I won't. We approach the chalice with the question of, if this will help me, I can be clean instead of following the advice of this father, approaching the chalice with faith in Christ or with recognition of our lack of faith and with the earnest plea, Lord, I believe, help me in my unbelief. Our Lord desires for our salvation, brothers and sisters. He desires for us to be with him. He has made the way clear for us through his cross and through his resurrection. He has endured those very same things we have endured, and he desires for us to be with him, if only we would turn to him, if only we would struggle to be with him in his church. So brothers and sisters, this is given to us at the latter days of the fast. In two weeks, it is Palm Sunday. Lent is over, and we then enter into the Holy Week. So let us struggle in these next two weeks to really fight against those passions in a meaningful and earnest way. Let us fast, not just abstaining from non-Lenten foods, but also struggle to restrict our plates, struggle to tighten our belts, to eat only what is needed, 
to move on. And then let us pray and let us pray earnestly and fervently and with all intention that we may be with the Lord, recognizing our own infirmities, recognizing our own failings, and like this father of this child, asking the Lord to help us with these failings. If we do this, brothers and sisters, we will enter into the Great Lent. We will enter out of the Great Lent, rather, knowing ourselves a little more, knowing our weaknesses, knowing where we need to struggle, and meeting the Lord who shows us what he has done with those things, the cross, the three-day burial, and the resurrection. May the Lord grant this to all of us. Amen.